Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Shelley, uh, Shelley Bernstein. You've probably getting, been getting emails from me. Um, anytime you get one of those things after you register, um, that's all me talking. Um, I'm the Deputy Director of Audience Engagement here at the Barnes, the Chief Experience Officer at the Barnes, and I'm the organizer of Let's Connect. So Let's Connect was this thing that I sort of thought of um, and sort of went and talked my colleagues into. Um, and they, I'm very grateful that they were like, hey, that sounds kind of cool. Let's do it. Um, I'm here to introduce uh, my amazing colleague, Martha Lucy, today. Uh, I think what we figured we would do is start with uh, a little bit of history about the barns and the collection here, uh, and then we'd go into some project logistics and then have a big Q&A. Um, Martha is the deputy director of, um, I'm going to get this right, uh, collection research, interpretation, and education, and she's also a curator here at the barns. Um, so please welcome Martha, and we'll get started. Thanks, Shelley, and um, I'm really excited about this project. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the history of the collection uh, just a, a little bit, what the Barnes Foundation is, who Albert Barnes was. Some of you know all of this stuff and are probably going to be um, a little bored, so just, <laughs> just bear with me, but maybe, maybe you don't know everything that I'm going to say. Um, and then we will have time to talk about um, any questions that you might have. But I think that this is kind of just to get your juices flowing as you're thinking about this project. Um, so can we dim the lights a little bit? This is Albert Barnes. He, um, he is the man behind the, the foundation. He created the Barnes Foundation. He was born in Philadelphia in 1872. His story is a uh, sort of classic rags to riches story. He was not from a wealthy family. He was from a poor family, um, originally in South Philly and then uh, in North Philly. He was an incredibly determined person, very competitive, very smart. Um, and he got himself into Central High and then to the University of Pennsylvania, where he got a medical degree. Um, he made his money by developing a drug called Argerol, which um, was a silver nitrate compound that was used to protect against um, infection, like gonorrhea um, and newborn blindness. And it was eventually made obsolete by the um, development of antibiotics, but not before he became incredibly wealthy. So by, you know, by the time he's 30 years old, he's got this company He's a brilliant marketer, and he um, is a millionaire. Um, he decides that he wants to start collecting art, um, and he was, you know, he was a very confident person with a big ego. But he was also, and this is one of the things that I admire about him, he was. Um, he was sort of smart enough to know when he didn't know something and when he needed help. So he knew that he didn't know um, as much as he wanted to know about art. So he sought out one of his friends from high school, William Glackens. There's the Ar bottle of the Argerol. Here's his friend, William Glackens. He had gone to high school with Glackens. Um, and remembered him as a, an, an artist type. That's how he describes him. Um, he reconnected with him around 1911. And he said, I am interested in art. I want to learn about it. Can you please help me? And so Glackens, it, it kind of rekindled their friendship. Um, they would go to galleries together and look. Um, Barnes thought that Glacken had just the best eyes in America. That was, that's, a, that's a quote. He, he says that about Glackens. And so with Glackens' help, Barnes decides that he is most interested in modern art. He doesn't want to collect the, the, kind of the more established artists. He wants to focus on what's new and contemporary. And um, so he sends Glackens to Paris in 1912 with $20,000 and says, bring me back the best of the moderns. So Glackens goes over, hunts around, and comes back with 
33 paintings. Um, here are two of them. The Van Gogh postman, Picasso on the right, uh, the woman with the cigarette, um, so, and, and many more that I'm not showing. But Glackens obviously did pretty well, um, and these paintings and the dozens of others formed the core of Barnes's, formed sort of the germ of Barnes's collection. So it did not take long, this was 1912, um, for Barnes to develop the confidence to begin collecting on his own without kind of sending somebody to do it. So he starts going, he starts traveling, he starts going to Paris, he starts going to New York um, and going to all the galleries and buying like crazy, just buying things like mad. Like when he decided that he liked something, he just went for it. We have these receipts in the archives with like 20 paintings, you know, Matisse, Renoir, 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 just listed that he just bought kind of all at once. So he adds, <coughs> He starts to add Matisse to his collection. He adds Cezanne. He adds Renoir. There are 181 Renoirs in the collection. Um, and he adds more Picasso. There are 46 Picassos in the collection. Um, so obviously his interest here is really French modernism. He, he is sort of obsessed with these, these four artists. I think that it's it's really important to remember as you're thinking about the history of the Barnes Foundation and the history of our collection and even about sort of Philadelphia um, in, as a player in the art world, we need to remember that these artists who are so, we're so used to them today. Um, they're, you know, you see these, these images in art history classes. They're part of the canon, Matisse, Picasso, Van Gogh. At the time that Barnes was collecting, these artists were absolutely considered radical and um, even deranged. I mean, there were actually doctors who would write in the newspapers at the time and diagnose these artists as, as they, they had something wrong with their brains because they were, you know, they were painting this way. And Barnes was this great defender of modernism. Um, people thought that Barnes was crazy for collecting this art. Here's a newspaper article from the Inquirer from 1923. Um, America's six million dollar shrine for all the craziest art. How a Pennsylvania millionaire is spending a fortune to prove the futurists and cubics are not insane and to teach us to admire their strange work as he does. Um, just another bit to kind of put all of his collecting in context, the Armory Show. Um, which is a, a famous kind of art historical moment, um, happened in 1913 in New York. And this was considered the, um, the, 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 the moment when the American public was introduced to European modernism. And it was this great scandal. This was where like Duchamp's new Descending the Staircase was shown. And it was this big, big scandal. Barnes was collecting right around this time, even before the Armory Show happened. Um, so not everybody, um, of course, was, was put off by the art that Barnes was collecting. He, um, he really gained the admiration of artists especially the artists who lived around the area in Philadelphia and New York. Charles Demuth, um, Glackens, he was already friends with, Maurice Prendergast, um, Horace Pippin eventually. Um, and they knew about his collection, even though it was not public yet. This is still his private collection. They knew that this person in Marion was just collecting all of this stuff from Europe, the European avant-garde, which was what a lot of these artists wanted to be doing. They, they wanted to kind of get out of the slumber that a lot of people accused American art of being in, in the early 20th century. And they, so they were looking to, to European modernism. And here it was in, in, this, in this house in Marion. Um, think about the fact that there's no MoMA 
I'm talking about the 1920s. MoMA didn't open until 1929. So there's nowhere in the US for people to see modern art. So the artists like flocked to the Barnes Foundation. And Charles Demuth described it as that we have this letter in the archives as one of the seven wonders of the world. So Demuth became good friends with Barnes. Um, he would come here and study the, I mean, really study the, the Cezans. Um, here's a detail from one of the Cezans in the collection. And here's, um, I'm not saying that this was directly influenced by this, but you can see how Demuth is absorbing Cezanne. So as Barnes is collecting, um, now we're still sort of in the 1910s, early 1920s, he's also continuing to run his Argerol factory. And here is where the factory was. Um, the building is still there at, at, at 40th and Filbert. It was the Hotel Powelton. And um, in 1902, he and his, his business partner rented eight rooms um, to make their Argerol. Barnes eventually um, bought the building. So he had about, at, at the height, he had about, about 20 workers. Um, many, you know, uh, many of them were African Americans. Um, I think all of them had very little schooling. And Barnes did something that was kind of extraordinary. He decided that he was going to um, he was going to cut the workday early for all of his workers and hold seminars for two hours every day. Um, the seminars were on art, philosophy. Um, he would bring in his paintings so that the workers could study them. And as he's doing this, he's reading the work of John Dewey, the American philosopher and actually developing a friendship with him. Here they are together in the galleries. And he was particularly struck by Dewey's ideas about democracy and education. Really the, the idea that you can't truly have a democratic society unless you have a knowledgeable um, citizenry. So he believed in education. He believed in democracy and education. And he decided that he wanted to take this experiment that he was doing in the factories and really do it full blown. So we're, now we're at about 1922. And he decides to take his whole collection, which by now is about 400 works, and just devote it to uh, what would eventually become the Barnes Foundation. He branches out beyond European, French, uh, especially French modernism. He starts collecting Navajo rugs and blankets, Chinese, uh, ancient Chinese art, um, African art, and old masters. He also starts collecting metal objects. You'll see those in the galleries. And um, I'll talk in a minute about the way that they're hung. And he really, you know, this was the, the whole idea behind this was that he was going to open this foundation um, only to students, only to students who, who wanted to be here, and that it was not for, for everybody. It was only for ordinary people. Um, it is that ordinary person with little schooling whom we want to teach to use the qualities of mind, heart, and soul with which he was endowed by nature in such a way that he will be able to understand what the artists have done. That is the main idea of the foundation. So he opens the foundation in Marion. There's the original building on the left. And he starts teaching classes. Um, this is sort of a late picture. This is from the 1940s. Um, I don't have any pictures of him teaching earlier. Um, but he wasn't the only one who taught. Um, there were lots of, lots of teachers, and they were, they were very active. So Barnes had a very specific way of 
thinking about art and looking at art and talking about art. And that was, now here's, so here's one of the great um, pieces of African sculpture in the collection. Um, he believed that when you are looking at a work of art, what you should focus on is primarily the form of the work. So what it looks like, how the artist uses line and space and color to, to construct um, a picture or, or an object. Um, what's not of interest to Barnes so much is content or kind of historical context. So he's not, in his, in his teachings, he's not so concerned about who these people might have been, what they would have represented in their society, how such an object might have been used. It's all about form. And there was a, a, a very good reason for that. He believed that by focusing on form, this was the most democratic way to approach art because it didn't require any kind of um, background in like classical literature or um, history. You could just deal with what was in front of you. All you had to have to understand the art and to be able to engage with it was your eyes. Here's just another example. Um, in discussing a Gauguin, Barnes would have focused on the composition, the, the triangle, that salmon piece of sand, the play of you know, the sort of the color combinations, the, 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 the warm and cool colors, um, the brush strokes. What he wouldn't have talked about is where, where this painting was painted, the fact that Gauguin had traveled to Tahiti, the fact that this painting was done at the height of France's colonial powers, and that's a significant to understanding really what this painting is all about. So his interest in form, ab above all else, is expressed in the way that he arranged the collection. And this is something that we're, we're known for, the kind of the, the, the dense hang, the kind of idiosyncratic hang. I mean, this is our logo right here. It's one of the ensembles. He called his groupings the ensembles. And he arranged everything very meticulously. He spent hours, day, you know, weeks arranging these things and, and kind of rearranging them to get them right. Um, and I will add, I will say right now that all of the ensembles, so each of these groupings on the wall, which includes the um, three-dimensional objects, are exactly as they were in Marion. So when the foundation, when we moved to this building on the parkway, we arranged everything exactly the same way. Um, now, what makes his hang different from what you get in most museums is not just the kind of the density, but... Um, the fact that he puts things together that you normally wouldn't see together. So um, at, at, at most museums, you'll see you know, all the American works together, um, maybe all of the decorative arts somewhere else, um, ancient art somewhere else. Barnes pays no attention to kind of historical categories or chronologies. He, he mixes everything together based on form, which things are kind of using the same formal vocabularies. Um, so... Here, it's probably kind of hard to see in the slide, but you've got this Gauguin, which was done in the late, late 19th century by a French artist next to these two early 20th century uh, paintings by an American artist with a Pennsylvania German chest. Um, I think that this is a, an English teapot, and he's putting them together because of the way that they pick up on, on each other. So... You know, the, and it, I can't say exactly what Barnes's thinking was because he didn't leave a record like that, but we know in general that he was interested in, in formal analogies and correspondences. So you can look at this and say, okay, well, these must be together because there's a certain pattern that goes on in the Prendergast, and there's a kind of pattern here, there's kind of a rhythm here. I mean, the more you look at these, the more you start to just pick up these analogies, and intentional or not, you know. 
like this. Somebody pointed this out to me that this, the spout of the teacup or teapot kind of mimics the shape of the branch. Um, so I th it's been interesting for me um, over the years to hear about how people, just to sort of listen to visitors and, and to talk to colleagues about the, the hang of this collection because there's, there's all sorts of different responses to it. People, some people find it really liberating, um, you know, kind of exciting, like things are not what, where you expect them to be. There's no um, labels next to any of the, there's no explanatory text anywhere. And, you know, the idea was that he wanted to keep your focus on the visual. Um, other people, I think, find it, can find it frustrating because, it, because it's not historically arranged. So I think that, um, oh, here's another example just of a, another ensemble. Um, and I'm showing this one to just emphasize the kind of the, the, the real mixing of cultures that you get here. So this is a case with African sculpture and um, some medieval European paintings above and metalworks and spatulas and, you know, uh, American furniture. Um, and he's putting, you know, when you look at this, you'll see that he's putting the, these things, he's, he's, he's got to be interested in the verticality here and the, the verticality in the, the sticks um, in the painting above. Um, So, you know, I think that that the that Barnes's focus on formalism is interesting and important. Um, I think that um, the arrangement is interesting, different, important. I think it also poses problems um, because of the uh, lack, because of the sort of disregard for history. You know, you don't, um, sometimes the objects in the collection get divorced from their original meanings. So this whole group of African objects here, you know, while he was such an admirer of their, their form, the, 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 the artist's aesthetic, um, you don't have any sense from the way that, that, that things are displayed of where they came from. So as you're thinking about um, your projects, and I think Shelley will talk more about this too, um, we're inviting you, and to correct me if I'm misrepresenting this, but we're inviting you to respond to a single work of art in the collection. Um, and I think the, 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 way that, the way that you respond is obviously up to you. I mean, you're artists. Um, I wanted to bring out the importance of, of form for Barnes and to talk about the ways that he found formal similarities between objects that you really just normally don't think about together. It's one of the exciting things about our collection, I think. Um, but I also wanted to really emphasize the fact that these objects do have histories, do have, were made during specific moments in history, you know, and, and have these, these whole histories from before they came into the collection. And so if you are interested in those kinds of histories and kind of re, somehow kind of reconnecting a work in our collection to those histories through your piece, that, that's also very interesting. Um, I think that's it. So the, the first step in the process is there's an artist open call. You're here, you have a sense of what that is. Uh, it's a six week period. Uh, you have unlimited access to the collection during the six week period. Um, when you come in, you say hello to our staff right at the collection door. Uh, many of you have probably already done this. Um, they are super nice and have really um, taken on uh, this project really uh, in a lovely way. Um, when they sign you in, they're going to give you uh, a rubber wristband. Um, the, the great thing about this wristband is it just lets you in and out. You don't have to check in with them at any other time. You can just come in and out. Um, 
And I wanted to point out that we have an art team in the collection. If you see um, any of these folks wearing these t-shirts, and usually they'll have an orange lanyard as well with an ID, um, they are content knowledgeable experts. Um, they all have degrees in art history. They know our collection inside and out. If you are interested in any of the works of art in the collection and you just wanna talk about them, uh, just seek these folks out and they'll have a conversation uh, with you. Um, as you're thinking about what to respond to, um, you are responding to a single work in the collection. Um, and the thing that you need to remember um, is if you decide to submit a work, uh, you need to find the object succession number. This is a little bit of a scavenger hunt in the Barnes um, because Barnes didn't install labels next to works of art like you would see in any other museum. So one way to find this is in every bench, you'll see these booklets. And then if you find the work of art in the booklet, you'll see that there are these numbers, BF65, BF61. That's what uh, we consider our accession number or our inventory number. Um, when you eventually fill out the artist submission form, we're gonna ask you for that number. Um, and then what we're gonna do is in our directory, match up your, your work with this work along with the artist statement that you provide, the artist bio you provide, your websites, et cetera, so that we can sort of tell the whole story um, in, these, in the directory that will be in the room. There are some requirements. Uh, many of you have already seen this. Um, first is the size requirement, the weight requirement. Uh, if you're working in 2D, that's eight by 10 inches. If you're working in 3D, um, it's eight by 10 by 12 inches. Um, and it has to be under seven pounds. Um, the key thing that you'll hear us talking a little bit about on the very lengthy um, uh, website pages uh, is that we need to have a standardized back. Um, we actually don't care about the literal canvas. We just care about that frame being on the back of your work. Um, the reason for this is because we have um, two amazing maintainer art handlers. Um, their names are Tim and Matt. Uh, and Tim and Matt are gonna have to hang an extraordinary amount of work in just a two week period. Um, and by standardizing the back, of the canvas or the back of the work of art that you are presenting to us, what it means is that we can have standardized hardware um, and standardized, uh, a standardized labeling system. So we know exactly how to label this, how to mark this when you come in to drop it off. Um, and that's why it's a big requirement. Um, you have to be from Philly uh, in order to participate in, in this. Um, we hope that that makes you happy um, and not upset. Um, and that's within Philadelphia County. And most of the zip codes within Philadelphia County are one, start with 191. Um, you have to either live here or you can work here. So we'll release the artist submission form on August, uh, a, sorry, April 23rd. Uh, you'll get an email. If you've registered, you'll get an email saying, hey, this is up. Uh, and this will give you the opportunity to, um, you'll give us your name, your collective name, all of the artists that are involved, the primary contact for the work, your address, um, all of the details. Um, there's an optional artist bio, optional artist statement, um, optional uh, websites if you wanna, if you wanna um, put your websites in. Um, and we'll tell you on that form what's gonna be made public uh, in the directory and what is private just for us to be able to contact you, et cetera. So if you're interested in submitting work, you fill out the form um, and you submit that, and then you come in uh, to drop off the work during uh, one of these two days. If you can't make one of these two days or times, you can send an agent. Um, you would fill out the form online uh, and we're gonna email a copy of that form to you and then you give that to your agent who will come in and drop off the work. When you come in to drop off the work, you'll be dropping it off in Seminar A, which is right across the way. Um, when you come in, security or um, a Let's Connect staffer will say, hey, um, go downstairs, we'll be there waiting for you. Um, and then the exhibition will run from the 21st of May through June 4th. Um, the, we really only have two weeks to install the show, um, and then it's gonna open for two weeks. Um, the works will be installed in the collection classrooms. 
these are actually inside the collection. If you're in the collection, if you want to ask a security guard or the art team where these are, they will point them out to you. Um, the thing that we love about these rooms and the idea of repurposing them is they are directly within eye shot of the collection, which means that anybody who's coming in to look at your work is coming into the collection, um, passing through the collection, both on their way in and on their way out, um, giving them some context here. Um, both the public and the curators will be able to select artists um, during this process. We're gonna be using um, Scantron ballots. I uh, remember those from your SATs. Um, and you should definitely check out the, the curators page on the website. I think one of the stronger things about this um, is that um, so many people in Philadelphia have heard about this project. And when we reached out to say, hey, would you be interested in being a curator? They said yes. And these are directors of organizations, staffers at organizations, um, independent curators. Um, anyone who, we sat down with Mural Arts and we said, who, who has the power to hire artists in the city? Who, have, who, who sort of is looking, needs to be looking at work? Um, and we came up with a gigantic list and sent out all these invites and this is growing. I think we have about 65 curators signed up as of today um, and that's rolling. So uh, there are many more invites that are out. Um, so this page will continually change. Um, when people are, and curators are asked to um, select artists work, um, these are the two things that we are asking them to think about. Um, one is the interpretation, creativity, or originality, originality of the connection made um, between your work and the reference work in the Barnes. Um, this is, you know, I think goes back to what Martha's saying. You know, you can think about this in, a, in sort of that formalist way, um, or you can go in a, in, a, in a direction that Barnes didn't go in and think about um, history, think about today, um, bring connections in. You do have an artist statement um, that people will be able to look up so you can sort of talk about that connection that you're making. Um, so there's definitely an opportunity there. And then the overall quality of the work. So it's a two, we're asking people to think about two things as they're making selections. Um, artist pickup is, is then on these two days after the exhibition closes. Um, and the most important thing to know about this is uh, you can also have an agent pick up your work. Um, please know that work is going to be discarded if it's not picked up. Um, one of the biggest issues that we had at the barns around Let's Connect was that there's very, very little storage space in this building. Um, there's so little storage space that just the logistics of the intake to getting it hung, to getting it unhung and to drop off uh, is a big operation um, because it, there's, there's literally no place to keep it. Um, so just remember, you've got to get here or send somebody as your agent to pick up the work for you. An announcement will be made on June 14th, um, and then the artist residencies will begin. There are three-month residencies. It's a $3,000 um, stipend for the period, and um, the residency is in the mural arts studio at the Barnes, which is the small building that we used to use for ticketing. Um, that's out uh, at 20th Street. So you can definitely stop by and peer in. Mural Arts is using it um, as their own studio now. Um, and this is one of the artists, this is Tanya Bergera, who was working in it during um, Person of the Crowd. It's not the biggest space in the world. I think it's, uh, the dimensions are on the website. It's something like 30 by 40 feet. Um, and it's just an empty shell. Um, but it is, uh, I think the, all the artists who we've talked to about the space have really liked that it's been um, very open to the public just through the windows. Um, and there are so many passersby, um, both residents of this area who sort of go to and from work along 20th, um, but then also Barnes audiences coming in that have the opportunity to see the work. Um, so that's it, the website is there. There's tons and tons of information on it, um, but Martha and I just wanted to answer any questions you have. We are recording this, um, so we're, we've got a bit of a throw mic here. It literally is like indestructible, I promise. Um, but if you just use the mic, um, that would be great because then we can get all of these um, recorded. We're gonna, we realize that with only three meetups, not everybody can make it here today. 
Um, the last thing I would say, uh, and this is, this is really, really important, it's extremely humbling um, to see people participate in this, whether it's, whether it's you or curators or public. Um, I am, every time somebody registers, I get an email, um, which is kind of great and, and a little stressful. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it makes me feel great every time I see somebody do it um, because I'm just so excited by that opportunity that we have. Um, and I just wanted to say that. So questions? And they can be logistics questions. They can be collection questions. Um, OK, I'm going to, I should really just throw this, but it's too far. But I am going to throw it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my question was about um, the residency and the hours that are within the residency. And if there's a time that's like too late or too early, or what yep. was the framework on the time? We will give you a key to the space. So it's just come and go. Um, and uh, we ask that you do an open studio day um, for a couple hours on one of our first Sundays of the month. So the first Sunday of the month is an amazingly high visitation day. If you, um, if, if you had registered early and you got the sort of artist news number one, you heard me say, maybe you don't want to come on, on the first Sunday of the month, um, which is our free day, because we see anywhere between um, 1,400 people to 2,000 people on site. Um, and that's the day where we can sort of put the open studio on the program. Everybody's seeing that. They have the opportunity to come say hello. Um, I think we're going to have a lot of people really invested in this. Um, and they're really probably actually going to stop into the studio to say hi. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we're asking. Other than that, it's, it's super flexible. Okay, cool. um, we, we're hoping that it's, it's not a burden um, is, the, is the point. <laughs> cool. Um, hi. Hi. <laughs> I was wondering if there is a place where, I, where we could look up previous submissions for this and or the yeah. people who have been selected. Previous. Um, this is our first year of doing this. Oh, snap. Um, we hope it goes well. <laughs> um, cool. It's a little, I will say, as an organizer, um, I've done a few of these before at another museum. Um, it's a little like jumping off a cliff because mm -hmm. no, there's no precedent. Um, and... Uh, we have no idea how many artists are going to submit. Uh, we've, to date, we've had, uh, I think we're at 258 registrations as of today. Um, we know we'll see a huge drop off rate. Not everybody who registers who comes to, to participate in free access is actually going to submit a work. Um, 60 something curators, and um, we've got the public registration open, but we're not pushing that yet. So, um, so we'll see. Um, Okay. Bear with yeah. us. Like yeah. if 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 it if you're in a long line waiting for drop off or you know there are glitches getting you in, mm -hmm. uh, just know that a lot of this is a first time process for all of us. Okay, awesome. I think um, right behind you. Oh, sorry. Question. Yeah. Um, for watercolor painting, mm -hmm. um, it should be on that same type of backing canvas. Could we like even if like put a piece of watercolor paper on top of that? Yes, and, exactly. Okay. That's what we're telling people, especially if, if it's photography, if it's any other, um, if it's, it, it doesn't have to be canvas backed. It just mm. needs that backing. Got it. Okay. Um, if that makes sense. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Paste it onto a canvas or? You can paste it or you can simply remove the canvas and use the the Just um, glue around the edges under it, the exactly under the armature exactly okay. we're, we're most interested in the frame okay. like go buy a stock eight by ten right and use the that framing and then that keeps everything standardized during the hang um, it also means that we know that we have writing um, area so when you mm -hmm. come in we're going to say tell us the orientation Let's, we're going to mark the orientation. Mm -hmm. We're going to do all these things. We're going to mark it with a number. It gives us a writing surface. It gives us a surface to attach the label. Um, that's primarily why we're interested okay. in that. That's helpful. Hey, Shelly. How are Hi. you? Hi. TR Risk. I met you yeah, the other day. Yeah, we met the other day. You're from Brewery um, Town, right? Cool. That was a fun day. Um, question. With the 3D. Yes. The 8 by 10 by 12. Yes. Um, does it matter how you design that? Can it be... No, as long as that, as long as it can be hung. Yeah. Um, it, no. 
I, and we're kind of leaving that open to interpretation because I'm like, I don't know if you want to build a, a platform to hold it. I don't know if you want to build an actual shadow box around it. Yeah, a little bit of both. I just was inspired by that. That was where I want to go with it, so I just needed to know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting thing. I, you know, we couldn't take um, new media this year because it's our first year, and we were like, oh, how do we do that? Yeah, right. Um, but we were we were trying to make 3D work. Um, so this is how we figured it out. At the well, moment. I think this is a wonderful opportunity, and I appreciate it. So thank cool. you so much Thanks. for your time. Appreciate that. I need to roll. I got to go pick myself. Okay. Up. See ya. In picking one work, like one painting or one chair or one statue, the artist is supposed to talk about that object or that painting or nothing related to Barnes or why he got that. Yeah, you're responding to a single work of art. Not Martha Barnes's Jim. idea because he didn't make it clear. He talked about form. I mean, it could. We're trying to leave that very open to interpretation. Um, and one of that, the that meaning what? Meaning the call. So when I say it's a it's a response to a single work of art, it could be a formal response, just like Barnes thought about formalism. It could be a thematic response um, because it's. It could be broader in this context. Um, it could be a historical response. We're specifically not defining beyond saying connection because we want to give you some room to try and think about what that could be. Um, to Barnes or to me? To you. This is about your interpretation of our assets if that makes sense. It's not Barnes. Not, not Barnes the person, no. Um, but you can think about f the, the thing that is unique to Barnes is the formalism, correct? And the relationship. So it's. It, formalism, I mean, shape? Light, Form line, uh, color, space. Mm. Yeah, was how he would often talk about So the word can be done on his idea. Uh, it could be, or it could not be. Not specifically about that painter or that chair, but why he. You will need to select a work. When you submit, you'll need to tell us which work it responds to. So you'll have to right. pick a, even if the response was about the entire collection as a whole, you would want to pick one representative sample to tell us that it responds to this. You ready? Am I ready? Not sure. These are hard questions. You, that's the hardest question. You? I don't exactly have an answer for that one. Okay. Yes. I had a question about the submission form. Yes. So um, I saw that was it's going to be released in April, and then would we, um, when we submit our work or before we submit our work, we would submit that form. Yeah, you submit the form before you come in. Okay. So what happens is we release the form, and then you've got a, a week or two weeks to submit it to us. That goes into our queue. And then when you come into Seminar A, we look you up in the queue. And then we have a bunch of things that we fill out on that. Okay. Um, and then you sign it, saying that you know, you've dropped it off. Um, and then you get a copy of all of this by email. It's, it's, it's super. It's kind of funny, like I'm a technologist, but we're using something called Formstack, which is like a, a, a cloud-based solution for forms and workflows. So it's not even something that we built. It's just something that we're using. Right, right. Um, but that's the idea. And you'll get an email. There will be, um, so when you register, your name automatically goes on our email list. We're trying not to flood everybody with information. Um, but you'll get an email from us maybe like, once every week and a half to two weeks during this period. And it'll be stuff like some of what was in this presentation or, hey, we just released the form. Now you have to fill this out. And here's the next part of it. Um, we know that there's a lot of procedure around doing this. Um, and what we're trying to do is keep the procedures um, down to just the need to know for the moment. Um, so you'll get instructions 
Okay. The day we like release that, you'll have an email with instructions about that next, about everything I just said. Um, right. Until then, we're just kind of like, uh, let's get there when we get there. Um, but happy to answer questions along the way. All right, thanks so yeah. much. Um, I would also say that the, there's an email on the website, connect at uh, barnesfoundation.org, and those come to me. So if you have more questions after this that you didn't think about, um, it's in the footer, feel free. Um, I, I try and answer those within about a 24, 48 hour period. I just had a quick uh, yeah. question. The other information sessions, are they just like this? Just like this. Oh, okay. If you came so we to this won't one, miss you it. definitely don't need to go to the others. Okay. We are recording this one today, um, which we're very grateful for because we know that not everybody's going to be able to come to all of these set, to any of these. So we'll have a recording sent out. Perfect. Any more questions? Oh, I see one in the back, one over here. What are your names? I'm Shelley Bernstein. Um, this is my colleague, Martha Lucy. Lucy? Hi. Hi. Um, I have a question about um, whether or not um, you said like media isn't an option, like yeah. new media, but is there a way to like power devices like, like through a plug or would it have to be? Wow, um, that is a good question. With batteries. And I have not come across that one before. Um, one of the reasons why we didn't accept new media was because we were worried about the power situation in the gallery. Um, wow. Um, interesting. You have stumped me. Um, I think we can get you power, mm -hmm. I think. Um, right. <laughs> like, don't bring in a generator. Like, it's a, <laughs> like I, think we can get, I think we can get power. The, the main thing to remember is that it really needs to be self-running. Right. Um, Beyond, like plugging it in, that's cool. Flipping a switch, we can probably do that. Um, we were really worried about um, video and sound work and the need to keep it playing on a loop. And with that type of work, we were worried that um, even though there is, you could install a monitor in the space, we were really, really worried about, we didn't want to run them on a loop um, because then the work isn't seen as much as everybody else's work, which is static. Um, so we were, we were thinking more about that kind of work, not about um, something that might need to be electrically powered within, um, within what you're talking about. Okay, so, so just as long as you don't have to, or so, someone doesn't have to restart it. Exactly. Periodically. It's got to be really bomb proof. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, and definitely um, during the artist intake, uh, if there's any written instruction that needs to go with it, uh, definitely bring that with it so that we can internalize that. Um, thanks for that question. That's really, I love questions that we haven't thought of and need to like think on. Um, so that's a great one. Okay. Thank you. No? You're, okay. Anybody else? So the work doesn't have to look like our source uh, painting or? So uh, the question is, does the work have to look like the source painting? Not at all. It can be, it can be any, anything you want it to be. Um, and you do have the ability, you will have the ability to write a statement if you feel like you need to articulate um, that connection, um, but you also don't have to. We know that a lot of artists don't want to do that and want to let the work stand on its own, so that's um, one of the fields that won't be required. Throw that mic. You don't have to take any other You have to pick a work to respond to, but how you respond to it is how you respond to it. It, it doesn't have to look like the, the work. It's, um, yeah. You don't have to be able to recognize the original. Right, okay. okay. <laughs> yes. Will you be pairing an image of the selected work from the Barnes Collection with the artist's mm -hmm. work? Not exactly. Uh, the work is going to be hung salon style. Um, your name will be hung with the work and your number will be hung with the work. Then there are going to be directories that you can access on your phone or at iPads that we provide. Um, and if you look up the artist by the number or the name, you'll get the info sheet about the work. And that's where it'll have a picture of your work um, so that you can make the direct connection with the physical thing that you're looking at. 
um, the artist name, the websites, the artist bio, the statement if you provide one, the, the work in the Barnes collection that it refers to along with an image. So the idea is that all of that is electronic. Um, it's hard to, um, we were trying to figure out a way to do this. Um, the one of the hardest things to do in a museum is to print labels. Um, you have no idea. It is like, I'm, I'm sure you're laughing over there, the amount of rigor that goes into printing labels and getting labels up is so hard. So what we decided to do was make all of this electronic because there's so much work involved. Um, when you come in to drop off your work, we're actually going to give you the label with the, the number will be pre-printed there, but there will be a line for your name where we're gonna ask you to write it in using a fine tip Sharpie. Um, and we're doing that because the production time on the labels would take so long that the show would be open um, and we would have no labels at all. So we've, we're trying to, it's a bit of a logistics thing um, that we're trying to solve. Um, we'll see how elegant it is in the end. We're trying to make sure that the directory is easily searchable my, mobile so that you literally can use your phone as you're going through. Um, and that's, I'm only not confident because it's the thing that we're working on at the moment. Um, so. I'll be confident, more confident in a week when I've seen a prototype of this. We'll have iPads in the room, um, but they will be stationed probably at tables or seats. So, you know, it's just a little less conducive to moving around the room if you need to use one of the shared devices. Wow, that elicited two questions down here. Hi. Hi. Can the works be framed? Uh, interesting. Wow. Um, I believe that they can if it is a part of the work. Okay. Does that make sense? It like, does. as opposed to being a some a frame that, yeah, it's got to still be within the eight by ten. Um, it still has to have the backing in the right place. Um, yeah. Cool. Otherwise, one of the things that we tell you is that there can be no hanging apparatus when you drop it off um, because we're trying to speed up the install, which is going to be pretty complicated. Um, you had a question. Y'all got to toss that Hello. thing. <laughs> so is it, is it going to be cool if like two artists pick the same piece? Oh yeah. That's no oh yeah. Deal. That'll happen. That'll happen because there. I mean, I, there are works in our collection that are touchstones that I think you see this all the time on social media, where people shoot the same thing over and over again because it they respond to it. So yeah, that's totally going to happen. Um, everything's going to be hung in random. So even though you're responding to something and somebody else has responded to something, it's very unlikely that they will be hung right together. Nice job. It really is soft, it really is. Is there any place where um, there's record or we can find more information about um, what exactly Barnes um, was and Dewey um, were both thinking um, about together <laughs> um, in regard to form and democracy and art. I think we're going to turn up Martha's mic for this. Uh, together, I mean, there's there are there, there are separate publications, right? Dewey's books, Barnes's books, um, but there's a there's a pretty big correspondence between the two of them in our archives. Um, okay, thanks for coming. We appreciate it. Um, connect it at barnesfoundation.org comes to me. So feel free to feel free to write as you think of things. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm thrilled. I hope, I hope that you feel like this is a good project. Um, I'm thrilled that you're here. So thanks. <laughs>